participants joining, we could go ahead and um, get started. Um, to those new that are joining us, I'm Stephen Bopart, Executive Associate Dean and Chief Diversity Officer of Carl, Illinois. Welcome very much to our Bleeding Edge Innovation Grand Rounds. And these Grand Rounds have been established really to build a community of med around medical innovation and innovation, innovative thinking. Uh, we've been inviting local, national, international thought leaders uh, to share what they've done, also serving as role models for many of us. So it's really a pleasure today to introduce Dr. Rebecca Richards Cordum. Uh, she um, received her PhD in medical physics from MIT and has spent her career developing biomedical instrumentation applied to global health technologies and translational diagnostic technologies. She's the uh, Malcolm Gillis University professor at Rice University, professor of bioengineering, and director of Rice 360 Degree Institute for Global Health. She's also um, well acclaimed with the MacArthur Foundation grant. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of, of AAAS, BMES, National Academy of Inventors, uh, where she cites over 40 patents related to her technologies, and has also been named a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor. She's been called upon by the U.S. Department of State um, to serve on the U.S. Senate uh, Science Envoy for Health Security, and uh, has a long list of, of awards that I, I won't go through today, but hopefully you get the idea of just the, the impact that uh, Professor Richards Corum has made on our society around medical innovation and global health. So it really is a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Richards Corum, today uh, to present uh, on your design and translation of new technologies to solve patient-driven problems with examples from, from newborn health, women's health, and, and even COVID-19. Um, so we all welcome you. And um, I would say that if you have questions along the way, please enter those into the chat. And then once um, Dr. Richards Corum is, is uh, finished presenting during the Q&A, we'll make sure we go through all those questions and feel free to ask, ask questions then as well. So with that, I'll turn this over uh, to you, Dr. Richards Corum. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you virtually today. And um, I, as, as Steve said, I'd like to share some of the work that we've done to design and translate new technologies. And I'm going to focus on um, two particular application areas. And um, what I thought I would try and do is leave you with some of the lessons that I have learned, that my team has learned over a couple of decades of, of trying to develop technologies that can improve patient care but particularly with a focus on low resource settings. And so the, the two challenges that I'm going to talk about today are first, newborn health, and second, cervical cancer prevention. And these are challenges that are, um, you know, I think on, on a global scale, really significant challenges. If we think about um, child health, global child health, we know that preterm birth actually now is the leading cause of death for children around the world. And most of um, babies who die due to preterm birth are born in low resource settings. For example, on the African continent alone, over a million newborns die every year. Cervical cancer similarly is a, a very um, significant global challenge. Over half a million women each year are diagnosed with cervical cancer and uh, 250,000 women die every year as a result of cervical cancer. And 90% of these cases and deaths occur in poor countries. There have been global calls to eliminate preventable newborn deaths to eliminate cervical cancer. But I think one of the things as an engineer that really strikes me about both of these examples is that we have so many technologies to help preterm babies survive in high resource settings, to prevent cervical cancer in high resource settings, to detect precancer early and intervene, and prevent women from dying of cervical cancer. And 
for me, what both of these challenges share is the fact that each one of these deaths, it's a tragedy, but it's a preventable tragedy. And so how can we as a, a community of technology builders and technology translators, how can we join with our clinical colleagues and think about making these prevent technologies to um, prevent these deaths, make them more globally accessible. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back to these lessons throughout the talk, but if there's one thing that I hope you remember, it's the three bullets on the left and the right side of this talk. These are the lessons that I've taken away from our efforts and our team and, and the community's efforts to address these challenges. So let me start on the left side of the picture here. And what you see in this top photo where you have all these syringe pumps that are sort of in a pile in, um, in a Ministry of Health warehouse is all too often the fate of technologies that were designed for high resource settings when they are simply sent to a low resource setting as a well-meaning donation and then encounter a lot of harsh environmental conditions that they weren't really designed to handle. They fail and they end up in what we call the equipment graveyard. And one of the first lessons that I learned working in this setting was um, told to me by a clinician named Liz Molyneux, and you'll hear more about her later in my talk. And she said, if you really wanna make a difference here, what you need to learn is how to do simple things well. And I think as engineers and technology developers, sometimes we sort of fall in love with our technology and, and what is possible, which is often amazing, but can be very complex. And that doesn't translate very well in a low resource setting. And, and you know, so we try and remind ourselves of that all the time. How do we do simple things well? The second lesson that I've learned is that when you're thinking about translation of technology, especially in a low resource setting, it is often a systems problem. And if you don't think about the ecosystem that you are trying to translate a technology into, your technology is not going to be successful and sustainable. And then finally, um, we've done a lot of work to strengthen biomedical engineering education at universities in Africa and think about um, the maker movement in the United States and what we've learned from hands-on design challenges in the U.S. And, and, and try to work with our collaborators and colleagues at African universities to think about how together we can um, strengthen educational systems for sustainability. Similarly, when we think about technologies for global cervical cancer prevention, um, when we're working in low resource settings, affordability is really a huge driver of our efforts. And so we've learned to look to consumer grade technologies where demand has driven pricing down, volumes up and then prices down. And this can be a really, really excellent way to develop technologies that are affordable. But often what we have found is that to get to offering clinicians real value, we have to think about how can we integrate multiple technologies together. And then the final lesson that I want to share is I think there are some really exciting opportunities as we think about incorporation of deep learning tools and laboratory scale manufacturing processes um, to allow us all, even in um, low resource settings, to, to manufacture cutting edge technologies. So I'm going to jump in to start with the challenge of cervical cancer prevention. This map on the top shows the mortality due to cervical cancer throughout the world. And the darker the red, the higher the mortality. And you can see that this really is a challenge of poor countries. Even though within the United States, we see that cervical cancer is a challenge of 
poor and more rural areas within my own state of Texas, if we look at the Rio Grande Valley area, these four counties down at the southern tip of Texas, what we find is less than 10% of women who should be getting screened, if they're uninsured, less than 10% of those women are actually getting screened in the United States. And as a result, in those four counties, the rates of cervical cancer are 55% higher than they are across the whole state. And if we think about not just technology, but um, medical personnel, this is a map of Africa showing the number of people per pathologist. And in some countries, the ones shown in red, one pathologist serves 5 million people. In contrast, in the United States, it's roughly one pathologist per 20,000 people. And there are some countries, Cote d'Ivoire shown here, where there's not a single pathologist in the entire country. So many of the tools that have been developed for screening and especially diagnosis in high resource settings simply aren't accessible in low resource settings. So if we think about the approach to cervical cancer prevention that people take in high resource settings, we screen at risk women, asymptomatic women using a combination of cytology and HPV testing. If women test positive, they're referred for a second visit where a colposcope, a microscope is used to view the cervix and a biopsy is taken of things that appear visually abnormal examined by a pathologist, and if precancer, the precursor to cervical cancer is found, then that can be treated with an outpatient therapy, either LEAP, which is an electrosurgical excision procedure, or cryotherapy. In contrast, in low resource settings, there are some um, middle income countries that have enough resources to do HPV testing. But mostly in low resource settings, people are doing what's called visual inspection with the cetic acid or VIA. They put a little bit of um, vinegar on the cervix. If white spots develop, then they get referred for triage and treatment. And the challenge with that is that, honestly, the specificity of HPV testing and even worse, the specificity of visual inspection, they're terrible. They have very, very low specificity. And so you end up with a lot of women being over-treated and all of the resources that go into that over-treatment are essentially wasted. And it's been estimated that of every 10 women who are treated using screen and treat technologies, nine of them did, act, did not need that treatment. So it's huge rates of over-treatment. And so um, we, a, a few years ago, started to think about would it be possible to develop a tool for real-time triage? And so we began to develop a system that we call a high-resolution microendoscope, or HRME for short. And essentially, this is a fiber optic fluorescence microscope. So you can see the fiber optic probe. It's a coherent fiber optic bundle. It has a field of view of just over uh, 700 microns and a lateral spatial resolution of four microns. And it uses a very inexpensive blue LED. You can see the blue light coming out of the fiber bundle as the light source. And then it uses just the same sort of CCD that you would find in a webcam as the detector. And we can build these HRME systems for about $1,500. And again, we've tried to leverage advances in consumer electronics. And similarly, you can see this is a colposcope that's um, made from a mobile phone. This is developed by a company called Mobile ODT. And again, this idea that you can use consumer electronics to replace a $15,000 colposcope with the very high quality camera that we all have in our cell phones. And so when cervical precancer develops, one of the changes that occurs in the epithelium of the cervix is that the nuclei of those cells become enlarged and irregularly shaped. And that's what you look for in a cytology smear, what you look for in a biopsy. And we wanted to see, could we actually visualize that in real time right at the point of care without having to remove any tissue? 
And so we did that by applying a, a, a fluorescent antiseptic topically to the tissue and then using our fiber optic fluorescence microscope, touching it in contact with the cervix. And then you can see these little white dots here represent the nuclei of those epithelial cells. And when we compare that to the biopsy results, this is what normal cervical epithelium looks like. This is what a high-grade precancer looks like. You see the enlargement and the variability in the nuclear shape. Um, here's another high-grade precancer. And this is a microinvasive cancer, and you see the absorbance of hemoglobin and the um, angiogenesis associated with that microinvasive cancer. And so we began collaborating with a really interesting hospital in Brazil called the Barretos Cancer Hospital. And the Barretos Cancer Hospital, it's, it's an amazing place. They have such a strong commitment to bringing cancer prevention to rural poor areas of Brazil. And they have started a screening program where they sent a semi truck out into rural areas of Brazil and they did cytology and HPV testing. And then anyone who tested positive was invited to come back to the hospital for diagnosis and treatment. And there was no cost of that care. It was provided free. But what they found was that um, between half and a third of women that screened positive and were invited back for diagnosis and treatment if needed, those women weren't able to come because they didn't have someone to take care of their children. They couldn't leave their jobs. Um, and so um, we started working with the Barretos Cancer Hospital to explore the idea of mobile triage and treatment. So they had a lot of good luck with mobile screening. And so with support from the NCI, we developed a mobile van that included a colposcope, the HRME, and then the tools for uh, leap that could be done to treat anyone that um, was positive. And we did a, a pilot study where we had 200 women that enrolled. They were randomized. So half of the women were invited back to the central facility for diagnostic follow-up and treatment. And half of the women were offered the diagnosis and treatment in the mobile van. And what we found was that um, almost 90%, so 87% of the women that were invited to the mobile van completed the diagnostic follow-up and, and treatment. Whereas in contrast, only 64% of women who were invited to come back to the central facility completed that, um, that diagnostic uh, follow-up and treatment. And so we were really um, excited about the, the potential to um, uh, improve the yield on their, their screening um, programs. And so with that in hand, um, we moved to do a large prospective assessment of the accuracy of the high resolution microendoscope. And so in this large study, what we did was we invited 2000 women to participate at the central hospital. And if they agree to participate, um, so of the 2,000 women who are invited, 1,600 enrolled and completed informed consent. What happened is they um, were imaged with our uh, high resolution microendoscope and then they had regular colposcopy with biopsy. And we were able to compare in this very large sample size, um, nearly 1,500 women who completed the study and had um, results available for analysis. We were able to compare head to head the accuracy of colposcopy and expert hands to the, the microendoscope using histology as the gold standard. And so I'm gonna walk you through the results that we found in that study. And so um, what we did was prior to starting the study, we um, defined the algorithm to analyze the images and that algorithm used morphologic image analysis. So there was software that segmented the nuclei within the image. It calculated the size and the shape of the nuclei. And then if there were a certain fraction of nuclei that exceeded a threshold for size and shape, the image was classified as abnormal. And so what I'm showing you over here is the morphologic abnormality score 
And here is the cutoff that we define prospectively. So before the study started, we defined this cutoff. And here you can see the results from all of those women in that study. If the biopsy was negative, you can see the scores were lower. And then cervical precancer is graded. They're CIN1, 2, and 3, and then invasive cancer. And pretty much everyone in the community agrees that, of course, if you have invasive cancer or if you have grade 3 precancer, you need treatment. If you're negative or if you have grade 1 precancer, you don't need treatment. And then there's a lot of debate about whether or not CIN2 requires treatment or not, and there tends to be less good agreement between pathologists between, um, that, that diagnose lesions of CIN2. And so we looked at our receiver operator characteristic curve. So this is the sensitivity of HRME versus 100% minus the specificity. We'd like this curve to be as close to the, um, the um, upper uh, axes here with an area under the curve of one. That would indicate perfect agreement with histology. And you can see our area under the curve was 0.83. And here is where colposcopy performed this open circle. This is the performance of HRME, the diamond, using our uh, predefined um, prospective positivity cutoff. If we used, um, instead of CIN2 as the histology cutoff, if we use CIN3 as the histology cutoff, our area under the curve pops up just a, a tiny bit, and you can see that colposcopy and HRME agreement is, is um, closer. So when we compare the sensitivity and specificity of colposcopy, the white bars, and HRME, the gray bars, for the CIN2 plus detection, you can see there's a small but a statistically significant decrease from colposcopy to HRME. The sensitivity of colposcopy was 96%, that of HRME was 92%, and our study was de uh, designed to be able to see a 4% difference. And so this was um, statistically significant uh, at the 0.01 level. And we were at 63% specificity for colposcopy versus 60% for HRME. That was significant at the 0.05 level. If we look at the CIN3+, plus, the differences were not statistically significant. Um, sensitivities were equal, and there was a small difference in specificity, but it was not statistically significant. And so, you know, on the one hand, we were disappointed that HRME didn't do better than colposcopy. On the other hand, colposcopy in the study was done by very highly trained colposcopists who are only available at this central hospital in Brazil and who are not available in rural areas. But we asked ourselves the question, can we use the tools of deep learning to take this data, a very large data set, and train a convolutional neural network to analyze the images and then apply the, that network to a, uh, an independent validation set that's held out. And so that's what's shown on this slide. So now I'm showing you exactly the same graph, but instead of morphologic image analysis, this is now for a multitask convolutional neural network. So here's that multitask CNN score, negative, CIN123 and invasive cancer. You can see we have a little bit better separation. Our area under the curve went from 0.82 to 0.86. And now um, we have no statistically significant differences between the performance of colposcopy and HRME. And so we asked ourselves, why is the convolutional neural network doing better? And what is it that is limiting the performance of our technology? And it was really interesting. So the cervix actually has two types of epithelial tissue. So on the ectocervix, you have a stratified squamous epithelium. And then on the endocervix, around the endocervical canal, you have a columnar epithelium. And where those two meet, it's called a squamocolumnar junction. And it's typically on the squamous side of the squamocolumnar junction where cervical precancers arise. And so we looked at the performance of our algorithms using either the morphologic analysis or the convolutional neural network. And so those ROC curves are shown here 
for all of the sites that were biopsied. So here's the morph morphologic ROT curve. Here's the multitask CNN. There is a statistically significant improvement. But if we look at squamous epithelium, um, you can see that here's morphologic, here's the multitask CNN. The, the improvement um, is not as great as it is for those sites that are columnar tissue. So here's for those sites that were columnar tissue, the morphologic algorithm and the multitask CNN. And if we look at images, it sort of makes sense. So here's an image from a squamous normal site. This was like normal by everything. It was normal by colposcopy. It was normal by histology and both algorithms got it right. It's really easy to tell this image on the left apart from this image on the right. This is also squamous tissue and it was positive by everything. Positive by colposcopy, positive by pathology, both of the algorithms got that right. These are sort of the easy cases where anybody that looks at that image on the left can tell it apart from that image on the right. What's trickier is when you get to columnar tissue. So columnar tissue, you've got these sort of um, invaginations that are lined by epithelial cells and the light scattering is higher and the normal nuclei are more crowded and they have a glandular pattern to them. And this is an example of an HRNA image of columnar tissue. And it was positive by something. So it was positive by colposcopy, but negative by histology. So it tripped the colposcopists. The pathologists who are our gold standard say, no, no, this is, this is uh, normal. And we got this wrong with our morphologic image analysis. However, with the, the multitask CNN, we were able to correctly classify it. And you can sort of see these sort of swirling patterns of uh, nuclei that are arranged in circles that are the invaginations of, of those um, crypts in the columnar tissue. And so that led us to ask the question, well, if the light scattering of columnar tissue is the problem, can we do better if we use an optical technology that does a better job of, of suppressing multiple scattered light? So could we use a confocal imaging technology to improve our ability to tell those columnar normals that are fooling our algorithms apart from the, the abnormal tissue? The other challenge that we had was the field of view of our fiber optic microscope is around 700 uh, microns, between seven and 800 microns. The biopsy area is around three to four millimeters in diameter. And so when you have lesions that are focal in nature, if you didn't image the same tissue that was biopsied, you don't know necessarily whether a discrepancy between the result of your image analysis and your biopsy is because of a registration error or because your technology is limited. So the other question we asked ourselves was, what, could we increase the field of view of our imaging technology? And so the challenge with doing confocal imaging is we're trying to do this in places where we need technology to be cheap, we need it to be portable, and we need it to be rugged. And um, Traditional confocal microscopes that you would use in a laboratory setting really don't meet those criteria. And so what we did was, again, we tried to look to consumer grade electronics. And so we um, replaced our CCD cameras with CMOS cameras, where um, CMOS cameras essentially read out a row at a time. So it's easy to implement a rolling shutter in your CMOS camera. And that rolling shutter could serve as a slit for a confocal microscope. And instead of illuminating all of the fibers in our bundle simultaneously, what we did was we took a digital light projector, just like you would have if, if I was there giving this talk and we were projecting the slides with the digital light projector, exactly the, the heart of the Texas Instruments DLP. And that allowed us to project a, a, a line pattern on our fiber bundle. And if we synchronized our illumination pattern and the rolling shutter of that CMOS device, 
then we could build a really inexpensive confocal microscope. And so we built sort of two versions of this, which I don't have time to tell you about all the details, but they're contained in these two papers that are cited here. Um, you can do it with one CMOS camera, or you can do it with two CMOS cameras if you want to have the best possible rejection of scattered light. And then we took that to the Rio Grande Valley to a mobile diagnostic van that is used in a very similar way to the mobile diagnostic vans in Brazil. You can see here's that mobile colposcope from mobile ODT, and here's our confocal HRME. It's a little bit bigger than the HRME that I showed you before, what we call the wide field HRME. And it's a little bit more expensive. It costs us about $5,000 to build one of these devices. But when we image columnar tissue, here's what we could do with our old HRME, the non-confocal version. Here's that same exact spot with this differential um, line scanning approach and you can see the much better rejection of multiple scattered light, better image contrast, and the ability to recognize the openings of these glands in columnar tissue. And so we're just starting a study now to look at whether or not we can improve our diagnostic performance using a combination of, of um, these imaging approaches. So how do we get at the limited field of view challenge? Well, the original HRME that I was showing you, typically we would operate that device with the CCD cameras. We would operate it somewhere between 12 and 15 frames per second. And that was good enough to not have motion artifact and to get good quality images. But if you wanted to move the HRME across the surface of the tissue and build up a mosaic as you image across the surface of the tissue, it really wasn't possible to do that because as you moved it, you would deform the tissue a little bit and that would make the images blurry. And um, it wasn't possible for the providers to hold the probe steady enough without the probe holder. And so we did two things. We switched out our CCD cameras to a high frame rate CMOS sensor. So these sensors can easily uh, acquire images at 200 frames a second. And then we built a probe holder that made it easier for the, um, the operator to just translate that probe across the tissue. And so now we're collecting frames. We're operating this at 100 frames a second in the clinic. And then what we do is we just use simple algorithms to do co-registration from frame to frame. And then we're able to build up a mosaic of a much larger area of tissue. And so um, we call it video mosaicing, and we started just testing it on lens paper that had been colored with a fluorescent highlighter. And so here is a mosaic that is built as, as we went over the course of four seconds um, from one end of the lens paper to another end of the lens paper. And you can see if we zoom in here, we have really nice resolution of the fibers in the lens paper. We track our registration error and defined a rejection threshold. And in this example, where we collected um, nearly 900 frames, all of them passed that quality control metric. And you can see we can translate it, uh, the probe, at speeds ranging from 11 to 50 millimeters a second across the lens paper. So the question is, does that work in tissue? And the answer, fortunately, is yes. So what we did in this example is we've imaged from the oral mucosa so we just took a little bit of adhesive paper. That's this annulus that you see here. And we stuck that to the inside of the buccal mucosa and a normal volunteer. And then gave that person the high, the high frame rate HRME and said image inside this circle. And then we built a mosaic from that. And here you can see the mosaic that was created as they moved the probe around inside the circle. And within individual regions of the mosaic, you see we have a really nice visualization of the nuclei. We, um, unlike the lens paper, had to exclude only two frames in this example where we collected over a thousand frames due to registration error. And we have to go a little bit slower. We could move between three and 15 millimeters a second. So I'm gonna try and show you video of this and hopefully it won't look too choppy over Zoom. 
But this is pretty much being played back in real time. You can see the probe is getting moved around inside that little circle. And um, you can see the individual frames look quite nice. And they play it one more time. Hopefully that's coming across okay. Um, and you can see a little bit of the tissue deformations as the probe gets moved around. Um, but it gives a lot more um, ability to the provider to explore larger field of view regions and do that in real time. And uh, about um, a year ago, a really interesting article um, was published by a group from the NCI that was also using deep learning methods of analysis. So they were acquiring images with a coltoscope, a wide field image of the cervix, and using deep learning approaches to classify those cervical images. And they reported um, a very high area under the curve for being able to classify just colposcopic images of the cervix. And so Mobile ODT, the company that makes this mobile colposcope, is now working to implement that algorithm in their mobile colposcope. But one of the things they're able to do is create activation maps that show the region of the image that caused an image to be classified as positive. And so we're now working with Mobile ODT to combine that together with our uh, video mosaicing HRME. And um, along the way, we've developed this training model to train healthcare providers how to do all the steps of cervical cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But we're beginning to evaluate our probe holder together with the mobile ODC colposcope in this model. And um, you can see this is just in the model, so now you're just looking at lens paper. But we can display simultaneously the output from the mobile ODT colposcope and the output from the fast HRME. And so here you see the probe is going in. Now it's going to touch the lens paper. You see the image of the lens paper, and now they're moving it around on this model cervix. And so we're working to incorporate this together um, with the video mosaicing as well as the confocal rejection so that you can integrate all of these technologies together in an affordable package. And our hope is to get to a place where you have the ability to combine screening, diagnosis, and treatment in a single visit, starting with an HPV test and then combining this um, automated uh, visual evaluation with HRME and cryotherapy. And um, that, that's what we'll be evaluating together with our colleagues in Brazil and at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I also wanted to just share one other area that I think is really exciting in the, the biomedical optics field. And this is work of my collaborator, Tomas Tkaczyk. But what Tomas has done is to really show how using laboratory scale fabrication technologies like 3D printing, high precision machining, and lab scale injection molding, and, and um, you can fabricate optical technologies that you used to need an optics foundry to be able to do, and you can do it quickly and at low cost. And I think the combination of this together with deep learning and the ability to integrate consumer grade technologies to make affordable imaging devices will really enable a, a very exciting generation of technologies. And so, um, you know, when, when I think about the three things I'm excited about in biomedical optics for cancer prevention, it's really making things affordable integrating these different imaging modalities and thinking about how we can push our methods of analysis and our methods of low cost precision manufacturing. So I, I wanna switch gears a little bit to talk now about um, newborn technologies and, and thinking about as we move more from the design phase to the, trans, the translation phase. Uh, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Can you hear me okay still? I can, but 
perhaps if the audience just mutes their mics, that might help. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, as, as we move more from the design stage to the translation stage, why is it so important to think about simplicity, to think about the ecosystem and the role that education plays? And so um, our team began thinking about the challenge of newborn survival really back in 2006, 2007, when we uh, began thinking about you know, the challenge of the equipment graveyard and, and how we could design technologies that wouldn't end up in the equipment graveyard. And as we began to have success with those technologies and try to scale them to countrywide implementation, we learned how important it is to think about not just the technology gap, which as engineers, you know, we, we um, have such an affinity for, but to think about, do you have the right human resources in place to use these technologies? Do you have a system in place that can implement them, that can order spare parts, that can organize preventive maintenance? And do you have a distribution system to deliver those technologies? and a way to pay for those technologies. If you are missing any one of these things, that equals unsuccessful translation and unsustainable uh, initiatives. And so the way that I actually got um, started on this line of work was I, I met Liz Molyneux, the woman that you see here on the left. She's a pediatrician who worked her entire career in Malawi and um, who has taught me so many different lessons, but uh, one of the most important is to do simple things well if you want to make a difference. And um, one of the things that, that um, Liz highlighted when she was thinking about uh, the needs of technology in Malawi was the challenge that preterm babies have with breathing. And so preterm babies um, typically lack surfactant in their lungs. And, and, and so the work of breathing is very high until they begin producing surfactant on their own. In the United States, this is, and other high resource settings, this is treated with a technology called continuous positive airway pressure, where basically you'll take a set of um, nasal prongs, put them in the baby's nostrils, and blow in a mix of pressurized air and oxygen to prevent alveolar collapse with exhalation. And so Liz really wanted to have CPAP at her hospital, and um, we like to tease her that she, she missed her calling, that she really is an engineer, because she actually made her own CPAP system. She found a vacuum pump that she uh, reverse engineered to be a flow driver that caused it to overheat. So this is the fan that she set up to keep the pump from overheating. And she set up this CPAP system. Here's the, um, the bottle of water that serves as the pressure relief valve for the CPAP system. And here are the job aids on the wall for her bedside CPAP system. Um, and so she uh, wanted a, a simpler bubble CPAP system. And so um, she wanted it to be affordable, robust, easy to use, no consumables, and she wanted it to meet international regulatory standards. And so we brought this back um, to our senior design program and my colleague Maria Odin supervised a team of students that designed a, a low cost bubble CPAP system. And you can see this is back in the spring of 2010. This is the system that they designed. Um, they invested about $150 in um, parts for this system, and they were able to show that it delivered the same flow and pressure as the six to $9,000 systems that were in use at Texas Children's Hospital just across the street from us here at Rice. And so to make a very long story short, we worked with a company called Third Stone Design to turn that into a, um, a commercially available CPAP device that is CE marked. And it's now sold for $900. It's been sold in over 36 countries. And we worked to scale it nationally in Malawi. And I wanna just share some of the lessons that we learned in that process. Um, it was named by the, the nurses in Malawi that were part of the initial clinical evaluation. It's called the Pumani bubble CPAP system, and Pumani means breathe restfully 
in Chichewa, the, the local language in Malawi. So the first study that we did was um, a study in a tertiary hospital, um, Liz's Hospital in Malawi, where prospectively we did a non-randomized evaluation of the outcomes of preterm babies that had respiratory distress. They were randomized to, they were, um, they received oxygen or CPAP, depending on whether or not a CPAP uh, device was available. And so here you can see the survival for all neonates and for the preterm babies that had respiratory distress syndrome. The blue bars represent the, um, the babies that were treated with oxygen. The red bars represent the babies that were treated with CPAP. And you can see that we had a large and significant improvement in survival in this study. And we were very excited about this and worked with the Ministry of Health then to scale that nationally across Malawi. And so we went to uh, 28 government hospitals and um, eight um, CHAM hospitals and looked at outcomes for babies that were either treated with oxygen or CPAP before and after the availability of CPAP. So the way that the study was set up is we had baseline data for oxygen for six months prior to rollout of CPAP. Then for 15 months, that the study was going on, we had data for babies treated with oxygen or CPAP. The study ended, but we continued to collect follow-up data for babies treated with CPAP. And so what's shown in this graph is survival, again, for all neonates on the left and preterm babies with respiratory distress syndrome. Now here, instead of just CPAP, I'm showing you oxygen, babies treated with oxygen or CPAP because I don't have baseline um, to, to show you um, for before CPAP. And you can see that there was a statistically significant improvement in survival, but it was smaller than the improvement that we saw at the tertiary hospital prior to starting the study. If we looked at the outcomes for babies treated with CPAP during the implementation and follow-up periods, people were able to continue offering a CPAP and there wasn't a decrease in survival um, for babies treated with CPAP at the end of the study. So it was sustainable, but the survival rates just under 50% is not as high as what we saw at the tertiary hospital where the survival was um, 65%. The good news is that none of the Pumani CPAPs failed with local maintenance. And if we compared that to the um, survival rate for the oxygen concentrators that we rolled out at the same time, we found that nearly two thirds of those concentrators that were designed to work in high resource settings failed. And average time to failure was just um, a little bit over a year, 463 days. So we learned um, good lessons. We learned that a nurse-led CPAP service could be implemented and sustained at national scale and that partnering with the Ministry of Health was essential in making this work. And the ministry actually became more aware of the challenges for newborn care across the country, and this led to more system-wide action and long-term change. But we also learned that the practices of rotating staff, the daily power cuts, they um, were related with negative outcomes for CPAP. And we found that hypothermia was pervasive and it was very harmful. And um, as a result, concluded that CPAP really does need to be introduced as part of a package of essential newborn care. We then moved to test that idea. So we added additional tools at those hospitals that were equipped with CPAP, including separate spaces for newborn care, room heaters, phototherapy lights, and radiant warmers. And then we looked at outcomes for babies treated with CPAP before we did that word strengthening and after we did that word strengthening. You can see a picture. This is a ward when all we did was come and put CPAP in place. This is literally the only technology on this ward. Here's the same ward after a separate newborn space was established you can see there are radiant warmers, the phototherapy lights are over in the corner and much more technology available. And that the act of strengthening the 
um, capacity of the ward improved the outcomes. Here we see survival before ward strengthening and after ward strengthening. All neonates on the right, the smaller, all neonates on the left, the smaller neonates on the right. And there were um, statistically significant and actually quite large improvements in survival. And you can see we're going from 40 to 64 percent, very similar to what we observed in that initial study at the tertiary center. And so um, what, what we're doing now is we've partnered with 14 different institutions to introduce what we call the NEST program. NEST stands for uh, newborn essential solutions and technologies to think about how do we bring together all of the disciplines that are needed to address not just the technology gap, but the human resources, the implementation, and the market gap. And we're targeting four countries right now. We're targeting Malawi, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, and Nigeria to roll out a package of technologies and services to strengthen care. We partnered with UNICEF to develop target product profiles for all of these technologies. They were just published in January of 2020. And then we have been doing a landscape analysis of what technologies exist. And we've been subjecting those technologies to evaluation against the TPPs. So we're going to simulate about four years of exposure to dust here in the dust chamber in our lab. It should uh, start blowing dust here any minute. You can see the oxygen concentrator at the end of that and actually the power switch failed at the end of that. And so we're taking this data back to manufacturers and now working with the manufacturers to strengthen their tools um, so that they do perform better in these very harsh environments. And then we partnered with universities, so two in Malawi and one in Tanzania, to create design studios, faculty exchanges, student exchanges, and um, uh, multi-country design teams that are addressing challenges like the challenge of CPAP. And for me, it was really the pandemic that showed the role that these design studios can play. Um, so at Malawi Polytechnic, you can see this is an article that was published in April 2020 in the local paper where they are developing a number of technologies, intubation boxes, drone transport, um, PPE, locally made PPE, as well as UVC based ways to disinfect PPE. They were visited by the president of Malawi. Um, he came to see the automated soap dispensers, hand washing stations, face shields, et cetera. These design studios have really played a significant role in helping local institutions respond to the pandemic. And so just to bring it all together, I think, you know, what the lessons that we have learned working in Malawi and, and now in Tanzania, Nigeria, and Kenya is the simpler, the better. You really do have to think about the whole ecosystem. And then partnerships with local educational institutions, both engineering as well as clinical, are, I think, essential to sustainability. And I think we have such an interesting opportunity as engineers to think about how can we use the tools of Zoom and, and, and other distance communication tools to help democratize knowledge to help democratize the use of imaging tools and other medical technologies by making them affordable and to demonopolize technology development through partnerships with institutions all across the world and through laboratory scale manufacturing technologies, which I think they make a difference at Rice. I think they can make an even more significant difference in places like Malawi and Kenya and Tanzania. So uh, let me stop there. I am happy to take any questions that you have and thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Richards Corum. That it was just phenomenal in terms of the way you set this up and, and really disseminated and made clearly impact in all these projects. We have um, a long list of questions. Thank you so much for people entering them along the way. And I also wanna give an opportunity for people to ask questions directly. 
Um, but maybe we can start with a couple of questions on the chat. So one of the first questions that came up as you were talking about these various distributed systems is, is how, how are the communication networks uh, that exist in these low rate resource settings, are these sufficient for that data exchange, that information transfer uh, that's so important? Yeah, I would say it's getting better all the time. Um, and, you know, it used to be, I think, a much more significant challenge. So, you know, data used to be quite expensive. Everyone has mobile phones. Most people mm -hmm. have smartphones, but mm -hmm. data used to be really, really expensive. And so, um, you know, people wouldn't text message even because data was um, expensive. And it's the price of data is really dramatically dropping. And, you know, we're finding um, WhatsApp is the, um, the communication tool that most people are using. We're using Project Echo now, it, particularly we've been forced into it by the pandemic. Um, but to deliver webinars and short videos and you know i think um three years ago i would have had a very different answer to that question than i do today um you know when i travel i'm able to get a little um, personal wi-fi hotspot, and it's very affordable and i feel like i can stay in great touch with anybody there and anybody back in the u.s i think it's, it's a really exciting opportunity mm -hmm. for us to capitalize on wonderful Great. So another question from uh, Dr. Johnson, the mobile treatment semi in van seems successful, brings to mind that could this be expanded to any specialty diagnosis or therapy? Yeah, I absolutely think so. Um, and at Barreto's Cancer Hospital, uh, a wide variety of cancer prevention services are performed in these mobile semis and mobile vans. So they're doing skin cancer screening, oral cancer screening, breast cancer screening, um, and um, really having a lot of success with it. They have funded it actually um, with um, donations from Brazilian celebrities. So you can see this is a very famous Brazilian singer on the side of this um, semi truck. And um, I, I'm from Houston. We have a big rodeo here every year. And Barretos, they have a big rodeo there every year. And, um, and they raise a lot of money for doing cancer prevention in rural areas of Brazil quite successfully. So mm -hmm. I think absolutely um, it, it is something that can work in many specialties. Wonderful. Yeah, that's such a good model to, to learn from. Uh, another question. So the you've mentioned differences between uh, your HRME and standard colposcopy, and how much area under the curve are you willing to give up, right? Um, because you're mm -hmm. able to reach a, a broader population, mm -hmm. these to be interpreted by non-experts, right? To me, it seems like those sacrifices are justified. I absolutely think so. And, and um, you know, when we think about um, the alternatives that people are using now, which are visual inspection, which mm -hmm. really has a horrible specificity, mm -hmm. or just HPV testing also directly to treatment, um, you know, I think um, those are the important benchmarks to look at. Um, and, and, so I, I think it's probably going to be a decision that's going to need to be made geography by geography because it depends a little bit on what is your current standard of care. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that's what um, we're likely to be judged against is what is the current standard of um. I think I may have lost audio. Can you, can other people hear? We can yeah. just hear you, Steve. That's right. Uh, I think we have lost Rebecca's audio. Yeah. The video was fine, the audio is not there. So Dr. Rebe Richards Cordoma, we can't hear you. Um, we can hear one another on this end. So it might be your connection. I believe you're trying, yeah, just another audio connection.
Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Yes. Okay, I called back in, sorry. So no, sorry. no problem. Thank you for doing that. Um, so another question from Sam, does the relative lack of interpretability when using the CNNs um, as opposed to human review have any clinical impact? Mm. I, I think that's a really important question, and you know, we we want to have insight into why our imaging is is working. And um, so, the CNN that we developed um, is a, what we call a multitask CNN. So there are mm -hmm. two tasks associated with the CNN, and the first task is nuclear segmentation, and we do that in a weekly supervised way. And we actually used our um, the segmentation algorithm that was part of our morphologic image analysis as um, the ground truth for that and then the output of that um, segmentation then is, is used as the second task in the multitask cnn so we tried to sort of guide it in a way that um, provided a little more confidence about the interpret interpretability um, because you know, I, I think um, when we don't have insight into what is it about the images that is going into <laughs> the classification, it's, it's hard to have confidence and it's hard for the clinicians to have confidence in it. Yep. Um, so we tried to structure it in a way that, that leveraged what we knew were important features. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you gave some nice examples of how these low resource settings are often the driver of creativity and innovation primarily out of need to, you know, to generate those. So how can something like that be captured in our curriculum or to inform students with that same type of driver? Yeah, I, I think um, in my, my mind, there's no substitution for the opportunity to do um, rotations where you're able to directly see what are the challenges that clinicians are struggling with and to be able to ask clinicians the question, you know, what do you, what do you wish you had that you don't have? What is it that makes your job hard? What would make your job easier? And I think um, a lot of finding opportunities like that is about asking that question and, and, and listening, really listening to the answers. I, I think personally innovation starts with listening. And I think, it, it, it also starts with listening to what, what are the commonalities that you hear when you interview multiple clinicians across multiple settings. And when you start to hear a theme across multiple settings, across multiple clinicians, then I think that's a really good clue that you've identified a problem that is worth digging into. Um, and you know, I think that's one of the things that excites me about the curriculum that you're developing is that you're setting up these really rich opportunities for people to have those conversations um, and, and to have them in um, sort of more relaxed ways. Um, you know, we, we have found that those shadowing experiences are some of the most productive um, tools for idea generation. We've also found that um, if we don't just limit it to clinicians in low resource settings, but if we go talk to the maintenance technicians and we go talk to the procurement people, um, they also have a really important perspective to share. And um, it, we sort of got to that too late, I think. It, it took us a long time to figure out the importance of doing that. Um, but it, it, it's added, I think, um, another dimension um, to, to doing design more effectively. Very good, thank you. Uh, just another comment from uh, Joe Bradley. Wow, this is awesome. So thank you. Um, a question, how did you, you establish partnerships for identifying in-context needs and subsequently implementing initial designs? What characteristics do you know, um, look, or do you look for in partners? Um, I think the, the probably the single thing that has made the biggest difference is um, making a commitment to a site over the long term and developing relationships with people 
over the long term. And I think especially, um, you know, doing a lot of work in Africa, um, you know, our partners have said to us, you, you can't believe the number of people who come one time, who want to come interview us, who want to come understand the context in which we work, and, and then we never see them again. Um, and it's frustrating because they're really busy taking care of a lot of really sick people and, and they have limited time. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really for us, what we found is it's not the first visit where you're going to get good ideas. It's not even necessarily the second visit. It's like the third and the fourth visit. And when people see you over and over again, and they believe that you're committed and, um, you know, sometimes it's just helping to do some fundraising. If they tell you, um, you know, here, here's an example. They told us they really wanted a transcutaneous bilirubinometer. Um, we did a little bit of fundraising, bought some transcutaneous bilirubinometers, brought them back, and just tried to be committed to helping them do their jobs more effectively. Um, so, you know, I think it's like any other collaboration that you have in any setting that it takes time to develop. And you have to think about um, it has to work on both sides and people on both sides have to feel that they're benefiting from the collaboration. Very good. Um, so a question from Elizabeth, one of our students, she heard about the bubble CPAP project when she was in high school and specifically, I guess they were using aquarium pumps initially. Um, she sees a lot of similar senior design projects that never ultimately get translated into actual products mm -hmm. after the semester. So she's asking, was, was it the original students that drove the projects forward after graduation? Or if not, how was that handed over to continue the momentum? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Jocelyn Brown, one of the students that was on that team, and she was in the picture I showed you, um, we hired her as a post-baccalaureate fellow. And this post-baccalaureate fellowship that we set up, we set up specifically to translate promising senior design projects from you know wherever they got to at the end of senior design closer toward implementation and so jocelyn worked for rice for um three years so she spent one year in houston where she worked to make the bubble cpap better and then she moved to malawi and she actually was um, a technical support day-to-day -day for that first clinical study and then she went to work for third stone design and was involved in the commercial scale up um, of, of Pumani. And she was there, I think, for two years. And, and then she decided she wanted to go get her MBA. And now she works for Abbott. Um, so, you know, I think um, we definitely saw the need for um, an additional step um, to, to take those really promising ideas and sort of move them further along. Um, and so um, at any given time, we have five or six fellows who are in that role of trying to move a project forward. Sometimes it's something they worked on as their senior design project. Other times it's something um, that um, a, another team developed, but you know, for whatever reason they, were, they had other plans, um, grad school, med school, other things. Um, and that has worked very well. And we have um, a, a Malawian student actually, so who came from Malawi, who is here as a fellow. There um, is are similar efforts that are happening in Malawi right now too. So I think there, there um, is a space for you know that that focused effort to move things forward. Wonderful. Well, those were the questions from the chat. I'd like to open it up now to the rest of the audience. If you have questions that you'd like to to ask, please feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask away. I have another that I was curious about. You had mentioned this design studio concept um, as kind of a, a means of disseminating innovation, you know, to the public. Do you think that's, um, you know, that's a route to really engage this type of community innovation? Um, you know, we often say and have talked about it ourselves that uh, sometimes the patients are the, the best innovators, right? That they, mm -hmm. 
you know, they break a leg and they figure out how to ambulate, right? I mean, they find solutions mm -hmm. out of need. Um, but this, this element of design maybe captures people's imaginations. I don't know if you had any other comments on that. Yeah, we have really found the design studios to be a powerful engine to support innovation. And I think, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that African universities face right now is a lack of equipment to deliver technology-based instruction. So it's everything from lacking computers to, um, you know, any type of electronics equipment or mechanical fabrication equipment. And it's really hard to teach design if all you can do is design things on paper. Yeah. Um, so for a relatively modest investment, you know, laser cutters, hand tools, um, 3D printers, um, you can really transform the ability to do both um, low fidelity and then sort of medium fidelity prototyping. Um, you know, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, not even hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to do both low and medium fidelity prototyping. Um, and that, um, well, in our experience, the, the biomedical engineers were very quick to um, take advantage of that, but then it impacted the entire engineering curriculum. So, you know, the mechanicals, the electricals, the civil engineers all are right in there with their students using that design space to support not only capstone design, but then design throughout the curriculum. So I think it's one of the highest return on investment um, things that can be done to improve the, the quality and engagement of, of engineering students and design in, in low resource settings. Very good. Uh, so Rebecca, this uh potential, right, to hook up those uh, design projects that uh, of high potential to uh, fabrication facilities that are higher end, right? For example, we have built a network of, uh, uh, we call them the Mika Lab Network, that actually can build anything from molecules to mm -hmm. buildings, right? So, so imagine this designs that they have made and fabricated uh, uh, with very uh, low end uh, machines, uh, anything that we can do to bring the promising designs, right, into an environment mm -hmm. with much higher fidelity uh, fabrication equipment, mm -hmm. we can take it uh, much further. So this type of uh, relationship, I think, would be very helpful uh, across uh, mm -hmm. geographic uh, locations. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's one of the challenges that we're grappling with now is, you know, how do you go from that medium fidelity prototyping to actually commercialization and, um, and think about, um, you know, really um, supporting innovators once they're, once they've graduated and, and how do they turn that into a, you know, a meaningful enterprise. Okay, other questions from the audience? Okay, well, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richards Cordham, for just your insight and inspiration and stories that you share. Uh, I would say to our students, we have an opportunity on Monday uh, at 3.30 to spend additional time with Dr. Richards Cordham. Uh, if you if you have that opportunity, just let uh, uh, Angie know that you're interested, and we'll get you signed up for that as well. Um, you can see there's many thank yous coming in on the chat, um, and I'd just like to extend my thanks and appreciation one more time for a, a great talk, and we look forward to hearing more. Well, thank you so much, and I'm really looking forward to talking with the students on Monday. Have a great day, everybody. Good. Thank you. Have a nice Take care. Weekend.